Welcome to Pennsylvania Newsmakers, and as always, thanks for watching. While we all have to borrow money, we have some very helpful hints coming up about borrowing money and what you need to know if you go to a credit union or a bank. But first, good teaching. We're going to give you an example of good teaching, and we'll do all of that after these words. This is Pennsylvania Newsmakers, a fast-paced, unrehearsed weekly discussion with and about the leaders who shape your world. And now, here's your host, Terry Madonna. Well, on this program, uh, over the course of the last couple of years, we have talked about all sorts of things education. And I, I promised a couple of months ago that we would talk a bit more about, about the people who are actually in the field teaching the children of the state of Pennsylvania. We're going to get into what really makes for good teaching and what we need to know about it. There's not enough emphasis on this, and I think this is going to be a very informative program. Joining me is Jerry Oleksiak. He's the president of the Pennsylvania State Education Association and someone who was a, the Markey Foundation Global do I got this right? Teaching Prize finalist. That's a long title, isn't it? It is, yes. <laughs> but I like that. Michael Suskill, he, and you teach up in the northeastern part of Pennsylvania. Tell us where. Uh, Wall and Peck Area School District. Wall and, I, I remember that name from history, I think. All right. Hey, look, no, seriously, we hear an awful lot about what's wrong with schools, what's wrong with education. There's a lot of good teaching going on, and we thought we might take a few minutes this morning and talk about it. All right, Jerry, let's start with you. What's the basis for what? Help me get into this a bit. Sure. Well, one, one of the, we all know that uh, education is, is a t priority now in Pennsylvania Absolutely. with our, our uh, citizens. And too often we don't get out the good news, the really good news, about the things that are happening in the classrooms in Pennsylvania. Too often it's, uh, you know, we're talking about budgets and we're talking about pensions and we're talking about, uh, you know, all these other issues. Yeah. But it really is about the kids and the schools and what happens in that classroom. It's called and learning. It's learning. And we have, <laughs> right. we have some outstanding examples yeah. in Pennsylvania of, of great teaching, and, and one of them is here with us today. Yeah, and you, you, have, you brought along a video, right? Right, we have a short video that will tell you a little bit about Mike's classroom and uh, why he was selected as one of the top 10 teachers internationally. Oh, wow, that's wonderful. All right, well, let's take a listen, and, and we'll watch it, too. <laughs> Welcome to Learning Lessons. Great ideas, great schools. Newfoundland, Pennsylvania. A rural town in the Northeast, home to one grocery store and one gas station. And home to one Michael Soskel, an elementary science teacher in the Paul Pack area school district. Mike knew there was a big world out there to learn about. He knew his students could make a difference. So he brought the world to his students through the Distance Teaching Project. Using Skype, fourth graders in Mike's science class taught kids in Kenya lessons on math and how to forecast the weather. Their peers in Africa taught them songs in Swahili and how to improve their garden. Mike's work earned him a spot as a top 10 international finalist for the Varkey Foundation's Million Dollar Global Teacher Prize, the Nobel Prize of Teaching. All right, well, uh, Michael, let's start with, with some aspects of this. Again, I'm back to my main point that I make over and over again. There's a lot of good teaching going on. I don't think we emphasize, what do you expect from a guy who spent more than three decades in a classroom? <laughs> and I see a lot of good teaching almost everywhere. I think it's time that we point out what works and what doesn't work. So let's start out with your, your general approach. Well, uh, first of all, I'm thrilled to be here and, and to represent all of the teachers who don't get recognition in the state, because there is there is so many teachers that are doing wonderful things, um, that that their mission is their students in their classroom, and it never never gets seen beyond yeah. that. So yeah. uh, it's it's an absolute honor uh, to represent all of them. I believe that learning should matter uh, more than just for tests and quizzes on a Friday. Kids should be doing work in the classroom and using their learning in ways that is powerful and that changes the world in some way. Yeah, I believe that. Every problem that we have in the world has a solution locked somewhere inside our students' passions. And that our job as teachers is to unlock connect, it. yeah, to unlock <laughs> it, to unlock connect it, those right. passions to, um, to problems in the world that yeah. kids can solve. You have something that you called student autonomy. And I, I, I take it that that means giving students more responsibility. If you give them responsibility, you give them, they'll actually do it? 
Yeah, I think responsibility is part of it. But I think also learners should be in charge of the learning. Too often we hear about instruction. And I don't instruct. I'm a teacher. I teach. You know, instruction is when I'm telling someone what to do. Um, I should be inspiring learning in my classroom uh, if I'm doing my job. And so a lot of what we focus on in the classroom is giving kids the opportunity to learn through what they're passionate about yeah. and connect the content to those passions so that kids are emotionally invested. Yeah. We're going to run to a break. When we come back, I, I, I want you to talk about, I want you to give me some examples of maybe projects or what students have done that you think matter in a kind of an approach that, that, that might uh, help us out. All right, we'll come back. Uh, teaching matters, learning matters. We'll get that all after these words. This broadcast of Pennsylvania Newsmakers is presented by the Pennsylvania Chamber of Business and Industry, now celebrating 100 years as the statewide voice of business, and by the Pennsylvania State Education Association and Partners for Public Education, bringing the power of a great education to our schools, our students, and our communities. This broadcast of Pennsylvania Newsmakers is brought to you by the Pennsylvania Highway Information Association, the go-to source to learn about transportation projects and issues. Please visit pahighwayinfo.org. And by the Pennsylvania Manufacturers Association. Business in Pennsylvania is our business. Welcome back to the program. We're talking about teaching, why it's important, and particularly with an emphasis on good teaching. All right, Jerry Oleksiak, you, you, you're now the president of PSEA, but before that, you spent more than a few years in the classroom, right? I spent right? more than a few years, 32 years in the classroom, most of that as a special education ah, teacher. I can't imagine a more difficult job. I mean, just the learning challenges and the patience that you must have, right? I, that, that's what they tell me. I, I don't know if my daughters would agree, but uh, I got it. I, I loved what I did every minute of, of the, uh, being in the classroom. Yeah. Just, uh, and and it, as, as Mike has said, it's about unlocking what's there already, yeah. just reaching into that potential and, and uh, letting kids go. All right, let's go. Give me some examples of assignments and what your students have done and, and how you approach this. I think the viewers would like to hear some of that. Sure. Well, we, we just saw a video of the distance teaching project that started a couple years ago. Um, basically, my students found out uh, through a cultural exchange that kids in the Kibera slum of Nairobi didn't have access to the same math materials that they had. And so they started teaching through short video uh, math concepts using base 10 blocks and other manipulatives that we had. But in return, we wanted to empower the kids in Nairobi also and let them know how much we valued them and how much they mattered. And so we asked them to teach us Swahili. And that went extremely well. It, uh, it exploded where teachers from all over the world started uh, sending in videos and having their, their students participate. But that allowed us to develop an emotional connection and a, a friendship with the kids in, in Kenya. And soon my students found out that lack of school supplies was not the biggest challenge that faces those kids in Kibera. Yeah. Kibera is a slum of about 1.5 million people uh, packed into about 10 square miles. And during the rainy season, their pit toilets overflow and unmentionables get into the water and kids get sick. And so last year, uh, through a collaboration with kids in Kansas and Greece, my students raised uh, $12,000 uh, in oh, combination wonderful. for water filters that I was able to hand deliver yeah. uh, to Kenya. So not industry. only then are you doing learning, but you're actually, do you, in your general approach, do you give students assignments and make them, have them, talk, talk about day to day, what, what, an approach that works for an effective teacher? Sure. Well, I, I think you need to start with what kids are passionate about. And, and honestly, sometimes kids don't know that yet, especially at the elementary level. Yeah, they haven't been exposed to enough. And so we use a lot of video conferencing, uh, and we partner with scientists and other classes and uh, teachers, students, national park rangers, experts from all over the world. Uh, in the last two years, we've connected with over 70 different countries, the International oh Space God. Station, and scientists in, in Antarctica, uh, so that kids get a global view and Technology understand. Technology matters. <laughs> it, it does when it's used correctly, absolutely, yeah, okay. absolutely. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, so through those connections, uh, my students have a, a broader worldview than they would otherwise. We're in a very rural part of Pennsylvania, a uh, small town. Uh, there's not a lot of diversity. And so this allows our students to travel without actually traveling. Yeah, tra travel without actually traveling. Now, in the, cor in the course of this, I mean, do you, in your daily interaction, are you lecturing? Are you, you know... Uh, 
as a college professor, I think I talk much too much, as I probably <laughs> do on this program. But, you know, g give us a hint about day-to-day -day that, that, ma that matters. My best lessons are when I'm walking around my science lab looking for something to do because the students are so engaged that they're, that they're rocking the learning. And, and that happens uh, frequently. But, you know, no matter what teacher you are and how much you've been recognized, there's always room for improvement. And there's always days where you're going around, you know, saying this, this just didn't yeah. work. And yeah. I, I believe that all teachers, that all people need to have a growth mindset where we're always looking to constantly improve. Yeah. And, the, the connections I have with other teachers inspire me to, to keep moving forward. The one thing, and either one of you can, that has struck me over the course of the last 10 or 15 years is particularly sort of the, how do I put this? I won't call it the destruction of the social fabric, but you've got a lot of kids that are in families. I mean, you, you have to deal with this every day, families that you know, having all sorts of difficulties. They come to class, some of them aren't fed properly, some of them aren't, you know, don't have the right nour nourishment, they're not seeing doctor. You get it. How much of that comes into, into play? It, it's certainly a factor. Um, and those, those issues manifest themselves in the classroom. Of but, course, yeah. But, but my job is to focus on the things I can control. And so, That's a great point. And so w I tend to look at, you know, what can I do for these kids to inspire them? Every Every person, every child wants to know that they matter. And so I try and give them experiences to use yeah. their learning in powerful ways so that they know yeah. how important they are and how important it is to be a lifelong learner. Yeah, Jerry, when you were in the classroom, I mean, particularly when you're dealing with special needs children, I mean, <clears throat> and the, the families really matter, don't they? I mean, I'm sure you got people from all different backgrounds and types and how you dealt with that. It, it, uh, it was, uh, every day was, uh, it, 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 there was no one way to do things. There, you, you know, you, you look at the situation, you think about what's best for those, that family, what's best for that student, right. work with the families as much as possible. There, there are some incredible things going on, even in schools where there oh, are yeah. those kinds yeah. of, of, of issues you're yeah. talking about, because the parents, the community comes together, the teachers, the, not just the teachers, the support professionals, the entire staff uh, commits to what they're doing yeah. for kids. Well, look, I want to thank you both for coming in. We wanted, you and I chatted about doing this some time ago, and, and great, keep, keep up the great work. And you have hundreds of, uh, thousands of colleagues who are doing similar that's, that's work. That's why I'm I, so proud to yeah. do what I do. And I wanted to make people. sure that we to start to talk about what's good in the classroom instead great. of hearing all the negatives. All right, this isn't a negative. We're gonna, you're going to find out how to borrow money and what you need to know before you do that with our friends from the credit union, Pennsylvania Credit Union Association. Come on next. This broadcast of Pennsylvania Newsmakers is brought to you by the Pennsylvania Credit Union Association. Pennsylvania Credit Unions, where people are worth more than money. To find a credit union that is right for you, check out ibelong.org. And by the Energy Association of Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania's energy information source. broadcast of Pennsylvania Newsmakers is presented by the Hospital and Health System Association of Pennsylvania, working towards a healthy Pennsylvania, and by the Pennsylvania Coal Alliance, representing companies involved in America's most affordable, reliable energy source. To learn more, visit betterwithcoal.com. All right, we all borrow money. We all have to go through that process. Uh, and we're going to find out what really matters when you, you, you start to borrow money, particularly large amounts of money. Joining me to talk about that is Mike Wishnow. He's the senior vice president of the Pennsylvania Credit Union Association and Bob Marquette, CEO of the Members First Federal Credit Union. They've both been on the program many times. All right, you just think you fill out a little application, you want to borrow $1,000, it's over, right? Yeah, there you go. No, it's not over, go no, ahead. No, um, oftentimes what happens is the borrower hears the term underwriting guidelines. Underwriting guidelines. Under, and what the heck is underwriting <laughs> guidelines? It's this big black hole that nobody right, right. quite understands. So, so Bob and I are gonna sort of boil those down for you okay. today and, and, and for your audience and, and talk about how they're important. And uh, so these are things, let's, let's go through, let's, we'll pick one of them. You want to do a credit history first, I don't care. You start with whatever you want to start with. But here's the point. These matter. 
Absolutely. All right. Well, number one, give me one thing that matters. Credit history. All right. Talk about that. Credit history is uh, most financial institutions that lend money report the payment history of those loans that they have to what's called credit reporting agencies. And financial institutions that grant credit pull credit reports on credit applicants, and it shows a person's demonstrated ability and willingness to honor their contractual obligations. Right. So when a person just decides, I'm not going to make my car payment today, or I'm not going to pay my electric bill today, or I'm not going to pay my mortgage payment this month because things are tight, it has a ripple, a ripple effect on effect. them in the future because whatever appears on a credit history stays on file for seven years. Right. So wow. uh, before you default so that, on a that, payment. That those scores that we hear often about between 400 and 800, they matter. Absolutely. The credit scores are derived from the credit, credit. report data. Got it. So, All right, pick one. Well, in addition to credit, you have income, okay. you have debt, and you have the relationship between the two. All right. So how much do you make? And that's all your sources of income, whether it's your wages, whether it's any kind of investment income you may have, whether it's government assistance, whether it's uh, alimony. Right. Uh, Rental whatever, income. Yeah. yeah, whatever income you have. And then how much you're carrying in debt, mm -hmm. whether that be credit cards, whether that be car loans, whether that be student loan debt, and then the relationship between the two. Lenders will look at the debt to income ratio. Got it. All right, let's talk about uh, about collateral. If, now, you, would you need you don't if you want to make a small loan, collateral? Eh. It depends on your credit history. Oh, see there, you're back to that. Uh, generally, I mean, there's secured loans which require collateral, right. and there's unsecured loans. Usually, usually your larger loans require some type of collateral or being a secured loan. Um, so collateral matters in some case. If you have a spotty credit history, credit report, where you have some missed payments or late payments, especially late payments, right. the lending institution might say, we're only going to make this loan if you give us some collateral. I got it. Now give, give, give me some examples of what would be collateral. Your home? Your home is an excellent example for collateral. But how about if you're your, a renter? Your renter, your car. A co-maker can be considered collateral. So, again, you might... So if you take the loan out with somebody else and they're, they have a good credit history, blah, 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 you know, they have everything's in order, that, you know, the ratio and all that is good. Absolutely. That matters. Payment history, length of employment, length of, uh, you know, time in a residence, stability. Lenders are yeah. looking for stability. Yeah. So, again, if they're going to make an unsecured loan, they're going to look for... What are the factors involved? And when Mike said debt to income, he's referring to the payments on that debt. Right. So you total right. up the payment <clears throat> amounts and divide that by your total income, and that yeah. ratio should be somewhere 40% or less, generally, depending on other factors. We're going to run to a break. When I come back, here, here's a question I want to ask you. This it all sounds like it's becoming a science. In other words, there's a formula. You, you have a formula that you use. It's not so much individualistic decisions as you, you get in these parameters, you're good. If you get outside the parameters, you can think about that. Okay. We'll be back. This broadcast of Pennsylvania Newsmakers is brought to you by the Pennsylvania Medical Society. Inspired physicians committed to the good health of Pennsylvanians and the advancement of the practice of medicine. And by the Pennsylvania Healthcare Association, advancing quality, improving lives. This broadcast of Pennsylvania Newsmakers is brought to you by the Pennsylvania Business Council and by the Pennsylvania Business Council Education Foundation. We're talking about borrowing money and your credit history and what all of that means. And before the break, I, I asked the gentleman here, that the gentleman meaning Mike Wishnell and Bob Marquette, this, does this all kind of fall into a formula now? You, you know, you take all of this, you mathematically run some numbers and you get it or you don't get the loan or go ahead. Uh, to a certain <clears throat> degree, that is true. Um, you know, there, there are your 
clear yeses, right. which are uh, high credit scores, low debt to income ratios, um, properties that make sense, or or if it's a business loan, ventures that that are uh, clearly documented, well uh, planned business plans, and there's pretty clear no's. Right. Um, but there certainly is discretion in the middle, and credit unions, and Bob, I'm sure can uh, tell you this, credit unions really do their best to try and make the loan where they can. Right. So what happened, you're, you're the man or woman in the middle, meaning the credit score and all this stuff that Michael was just talking about. Mm -hmm. What do you do? Well, if we get a, as Mike indicated, if we get a low credit score, first of all, at Members First, what we do is we ha have an automatic second opinion. We have another, under, another loan oh, writer, loan, loan right. officer look Got at it. the loan to say, is there something here other than just the bad credit score that might be a compensating factor? Let's say, for instance, let's say the collateral that's being offered is a home mm -hmm. with very little debt against it. So you're talking extremely strong collateral or maybe a co-maker too. So it, there are formulas that are used as guidelines. Some financial institutions use those formulas almost rigidly. Exclusive, rigidly. Credit unions traditionally do not. Right. Uh, and I know we don't. So it's a great question. Yeah. All right. Let's general question. Credit, is it easier to get now, tougher to get? Is it the loosening? Uh, you want to go borrow money? Is this a good or a bad time? Sure. Well, uh, I'll start, and Bob, please, because uh, Bob's in the field. From what I read mm -hmm. uh, in the trade publications, of course, going into 07, 08, everyone had loosened their underwriting guidelines, right. particularly large mortgage companies. Because we were in a recession and people were trying to make it easier for folks to borrow money, right? That and home ownership, uh, you know, home prices were appreciating and, right. uh, you know, everybody was making money. Well, what happened is everything collapsed. Right. And oh, the pendulum I get it. Leading swung. Leading up to it, I got it. Right. The pendulum swung, so most of the big players okay. really tightened. Credit unions throughout that process had remained pretty conservative, right. so we didn't get too loose. I got it. And we didn't have to react and get too got tight. It. And I think we Bob's have about yeah, we have about fifty way. seconds left. Go ahead. I absolutely agree with what Mike said. Uh, credit unions traditionally don't adjust their underwriting guidelines too much. We like to be a dependable source of credit to not only consumers but businesses. That's why the Federal Credit Union Act was passed right after the Great Recession. Right. Great Depression, right. rather, right. 1934. Right. So we never altered ours, and we had some business customers specifically that had longstanding financial obligations and, and uh, arrangements with banks that uh, were suddenly pulled back. Thanks, Thanks. Great, great, great update. All right, we'll see you next week for another edition of Pennsylvania Newsmakers, and as always, stay well.